All right, we are live. Okay, so hey guys, this is Ken with Minotank. I'm live just a few minutes early. Uh, my goal today is what I'm going to do is walk you through what it looks like to come to Minotank for the first time and decide you're ready to pitch on Minotank or you're one of our brand new investors, which we say welcome. Uh, and we're going to show you how to self-attest on the Minotank website as well as um, tune in for future episodes. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I am on a few minutes early. So if you if you check this or you miss it, it's totally okay. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen and we'll walk through a little bit of what it looks like on minotank.com. So we're about seven minutes till our show goes live. So I'm just gonna do a little pre-show for you right now. Um, just so you guys know, whenever you come to minotank.com, you can always click join wait list here. This will kind of show you um, what it looks like. Put my face back over there. Uh, this will show you what it looks like whenever you want to um, pitch on the actual Minotank channel. Um, through here, you'll go to minotank.learn. And this will kind of talk to you about some of our expectations, what the process looks like, um, the rules, and how it works. Uh, so this can answer all your questions if you're interested in pitching on Minotank itself. Let's go back to the main page. So you can always subscribe right here. This takes you straight to our YouTube channel. Uh, as we're going to talk about in the show today, subscribers are very important to us. It helps YouTube rank us. It also helps us kind of gain clout in the community, as well as because we are 100% uh, sponsor run. So sponsorship is 100% of our dollars right now that keeps our revenue running. Uh, it's really important that we have a larger um, subscriber number. So if you don't mind, click that subscribe button. It really helps us run our business. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about what Minotank is, this video right here can explain it to you in 74 seconds. And that's same guy, same me, same shirt. Um, <laughs> a few of the groups that are working with us right now, um, you can watch our next pitch live. And then you can learn a little bit more about the Minotank mission. So uh, while we have a few minutes now, I'm just going to go ahead and dip right into that. So Minotank is um, LGBT run. My, na my name is Ken. If you guys don't know already, I'm the openly gay LGBT founder of Minotank. Um, we are LGBT run and we do show preference and precedence to three classes of founder and that's female founders, minority founders and LGBTQ plus meaning anything that falls within that range. Um, that doesn't mean that's the only thing that we host on here. So you'll see, of course, a variety and a menagerie of people. Um, but we just like to bring up the fact that, you know, it's a very small minority of people who receive venture capital and it's an even smaller minority when you look at minority founders. So it's important to us to say, okay, if um, we can help them in any way, we'd like to do that. So we try very hard to go find great companies, amazing investment opportunities, but more importantly, that we also try to find things that fit our mission and our values. So if you want to learn a little bit more about some of the pitches, um, all of these links are previous pitches on Minotank. This links you straight to our YouTube channel. So you can watch any of their pitches. Um, they're always live live on our YouTube channel. You can learn more about them. And some of them are still currently raising. Um, so I'm going to walk through what it looks like as a, a startup who wants to pitch. So we have a little hamburger menu here on the side. If you want to try to find more information, just click this little hamburger menu. Um, you can always go to learn um, or you can even go straight to pitch. Learn will teach you what kind of expectations we have of someone who's going to pitch on Minotank. And then if you go to minotank.com slash pitch, it talks about uh, how previously we did have a fee to pitch. We've removed that because we achieved great sponsorship dollars, which is awesome, but we can always use more revenue as an early stage company. So we are constantly looking for new sponsors. Um, you can see what it looks like whenever you decide to join our wait list. So what does it look like to join our wait list? And then you know what will you expect once you actually come on the show? And you can see some of the previous pitches that have happened, some more information about them uh, and such. As an investor who's looking to, you know, your early stage tech investor, your interest is learning more about angel capital, um, you can click our little hamburger menu again and click invest. You'll see a few of the guest investors that we've had on the show. So you'll see Ryan Cole again today. Um, but more importantly, you can join our more than 200 plus investor audience. Uh, and how you do that is you actually go down to this form and it's an investor attestation form. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit uh, because we have a lot of brand new angels that work with us. So you might say, hmm, I'm interested in you know venture capital investing. Can I do it? Great question. So this is actually pulled straight from the SEC, the Security Exchange Commission's website. And right here, you'll see that um, there are guidelines based around who is allowed to invest into an early stage tech startup or any startup. Um, 
And so the two qualifications are you must make more than $200,000 for the past two years on paper. Um, there is one more qualification that I'll mention now just for, for your own knowledge. And I can link back to the SEC if anyone wants to hear more about this. Um, feel free to use the YouTube comments. I see we already have some people following in right now. Nice to see you guys. Hey, uh, please ask any questions you have about the Minnow Tank process, how to pitch on Minnow Tank, our wait list, what it looks like to get become one of our investors, anything like that, we're more than happy to answer. Um, so you just add that right in the YouTube comments. But the other qualification for being a venture capitalist investor, um, an early stage angel investor, I'm sorry, is that you must have more than $1 million in investable assets. And we'll be more than happy to link to the SEC website to teach you guys more about that. We ask a few questions. Um, none of this too intrusive. We explain a little bit more about what Minotank is. We ask for your information, what you're interested in doing, any previous tech investments you want to share. And then, we, of course, we ask our, all of our investors to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, so again, I plug this a lot. It's really important to get people to subscribe to our YouTube channel so we can keep our channel growing and keep this show uh, moving forward and profitable. Uh, so that's basically it on Minotank. We do have some other events. There is a really cool cryptocurrency event coming up that's uh, here in the Chicago region. So if you're in the Midwest and you'd like to go to the cryptocurrency event, um, our friends at FinTank are actually putting that on. It's going to be really awesome. We'll be there. It's February 15th. Um, and then we also have a blog to give you a little bit more information. During the show today, we're going to talk about Minotank.com slash vote. Um, we have had hundreds of people vote for our startups. Who's going to pitch first? So that's pretty awesome to us. So we always want to see, you know, and then now we're actually on to our top crowd choice. So during the show today, you're going to vote for your favorite startup and they're going to have a chance to win a bottle of Koval, uh, which is some really fantastic whiskey that I have here with me and a snack pack from T-Square. It's our snack sponsor. Um, so it's sponsorships like these that help keep our company running. So we love to kind of bring them up and we love to uh, include you. And one of the coolest things about Minotank is whenever you vote later today, so you'll vote as a crowd for your favorite pitch. Um, after you vote, you, one of you in the audience, whoever votes, will have the chance to also win a bottle of Koval and also win a snack pack along with that um, that startup team. So it's awesome. You actually have the chance to win something whenever you vote. So at the end of the show, when I ask you to please cast your vote for Minotank's top pitch crowd choice, this is where you'll go. You go to minotank.com slash vote, press the little hamburger menu. You can find the vote right there on the right. And that's that. We'll give everyone just two more minutes before we start the show officially. Um, <clears throat> if you're just tuning in for the first time, we suggest watching this on our YouTube channel. So you can go to, um, youtube.com slash the letter C slash Minotank. That'll take you straight to our channel. You can ask all your questions there. So I'm there right now. I can type in a question. Hey there, guys. Uh, I can see on your top right, you'll see the, uh, the comments coming through. So if you want to send any questions, if you want to ask questions to the startups, um, specifically to our investors as well as our founders, if you want to learn anything about more about while they're pitching, we ask this to be interactive. The reason why we spend so much time, energy, and money on live streaming is we want to have a two-way conversation. Uh, we don't want to be a just a TV show. Show, we'd much rather you as the investors, the startup founders, the enthusiasts, all be able to participate and communicate with us while you're watching. Um, so we'll give everyone two more minutes. If you guys have any questions, please shout out. Tell us where you're from. We're very excited. We have three awesome startups here today. And uh, we can't get, we're really excited to get the start started. Turned off my screen share and I am ready to go. We'll give it just one more minute um, to allow our crowd to come fumbling in. Sometimes people have trouble um, getting into Minotank. We're still trying to figure out, if you guys have any suggestions of how you got to here, uh, we're learning uh, YouTube Live with you. If you guys didn't know, YouTube is, uh, Live as well as Facebook Live has been around for just about two years. So we're trying to pioneer this path. Uh, one of our great successes here at Minotank is if any of you go to Google and you type in live stream pitch, we are always your top three or five. So within the three and five range on that uh, on that keyword. So we're very excited about that, but we're still learning how to get all of our investors and all of our startup founders and all of our enthusiasts to the right place at the right time. Um, great guys. Okay. So it's 201 now. So I'm going to go ahead and start the show. We have three awesome companies for you today and uh, I will go ahead and start. All right. Hey there, investors, tech enthusiasts, startup founders. Welcome to our fourth episode of Minotank's live stream pitch. Before we get started with our show, we have a few updates and even the opportunity for you, the live crowd, to win some awesome complimentary gifts from Minotank. A huge, exciting update that we are so thrilled to share about Minotank 
that we've had over 305% growth on our YouTube subscribers in the month of January. Why does this matter? Well, Minotank doesn't charge investors, nor do we charge startups anything, and our real goal is to become a free utility to connect the two together. But that means we have to find other revenue sources and other places. So we are very close to reaching our 2,000 subscriber goal by April 1st. We're about 25% of the way there, which will allow us to start deploying YouTube advertisements and generating more revenue from our channel. So if you're tuned in right now and you are not subscribed, please take one quick moment press that subscribe button for us, and that's going to help us fund Minotank and keep this going. Now, other than YouTube advertisements, Minotank would not be possible without the support of our sponsors to help make everything that we do awesome. So I would like to introduce a few of those sponsors now. So our first sponsor is Bradford Allen. Bradford Allen is a commercial real estate firm that specializes in finding office space and negotiating tenant-oriented leases for startups and larger companies too. The best part is that their service is performed at no cost to the client because all fees are paid to, Brad, to Bradford Allen by the landlord after the lease is signed. If you guys want to learn more about Bradford Allen or you'd like to contact them to help you negotiate any kind of office leasing space, please go to minotank.com slash sponsor or just look on our sponsor page and you can reach out to them there. Thanks Bradford Allen for your support. Next, I want to talk about Double Take. So, Double Take Promotional Marketing, our official swag sponsor of Minot, is our official swag sponsor of Minotank. Double Take can help you with all your promotional products and branded merchandise needs. The owner, Matt Deutschman, is a is fourth generation in his family in the promotional marketing industry and understands the value of you and your company's time. Therefore, when working with Double Take Promotional Marketing, you receive a white glove approach to your continual need for promotional marketing materials to maximize the impact of your brand. Thank you very much, Double Take, for your continued support of Minotank. Our final sponsor for today is Caxi. Uh, Caxi is the technology catalyst sponsor of Minotank. Caxi helps startups by planning and building cloud platforms and apps, as well as creating digital strategy to accelerate their vision. Caxi is your partner in creating the most direct path to reach your customers through technology. Thank you to all of our sponsors who help make Minotank possible. Now, a few more updates before we get started. One of our newest aspects to Minotank's show is our crowdsourced voting system. So hundreds of fans cast their vote to decide who will pitch first on today's episode. As I checked my numbers just a few minutes ago, it looks like Sheldon Smickley and Potable will have the bull share of the votes uh, with over 100 votes cast towards their name, and they will be pitching first this afternoon. Thank you, everyone who voted. And at the end of today's show, we're going to ask you to vote for today's top pitch crowd choice. How you reach that, I walked through just a few minutes ago, but if you go to minotank.com slash vote, you'll be able to vote for your favorite pitch from today. Our winner from today will receive a complimentary bottle of Koval from Minotank and receive a variety pack of T-squares snacks that I suggested earlier. Did a nice little branding pop for them. <laughs> we are grateful to Koval Distillery, our new beverage sponsor, and T-squares for being our snack sponsor. Now, you may be asking yourself, why is it so awesome that we have these beverage and snack sponsors from Minotank? Well, because you, my friends, our audience and founders, investors, and tech enthusiasts have a chance to win a gift pack presented by Minotank on today's show. So you also have the chance to win, not just them. Here's how it works. Today, Minotank will award the top pitch crowd choice. Uh, top pick crowd choice. <laughs> We're going to award them a bottle of Koval whiskey, single barrel whiskey, as well as a snack pack from T-Squares. They do have a couple different flavors, so not just one. <clears throat> um, with their newest flavor being Asiai Blueberry. But live audience, here's our ask. Whenever you, we want you to vote for Minotank's top pitch crowd choice, and you will have the chance to win a bottle of Koval and a snack pack from T-Squares, complimentary of Minotank. But here are the rules. One, you must be subscribed to Minotank's YouTube channel. And two, you must vote live for Minotank's top pitch crowd choice at the end of today's episode. We will award both the startup winner as well as the live audience member at the end of today's show. So don't forget to vote. Now, without any further ado, I would like to invite Ryan... Sorry, having a little technical errors here. <laughs> Sorry, I'd like to invite Ryan Cole from V Capital on the call. Ryan, how you doing? Can you hear me okay? How are you fine, Ken? Thanks. 
great to hear. Let me put us in gallery view so we should be able to see each other. I'm just doing a quick testing. Sorry, we're still learning how to use live perfectly. Um, Ryan, if you wouldn't mind, would you go ahead and give us a little bit about V Capital and tell us um, a little bit about yourself? Excellent. Kendall, thank you for inviting me to be here. It's always a privilege to work with you and your selected startup companies and, and talk to your audience. So thank you for that. V Capital, we are a Chicago-based venture capital firm founded by Len Batterson and Jim Vaughn. Uh, tremendous track record dating back 35 years. First big success was American Online. If you remember them, AOL. Uh, most recently was CleverSafe, acquired by IBM for $1.3 billion back in December 2015. We are a Series A focus. However, we'll consider seed stage and Series B rounds. We are sector agnostic with a preference for Midwest-based companies. When I say Midwest, I basically mean anything outside of California, New York, and Boston. Um, we try to do about six to eight deals per year, and we make them available to our accredited investors who can pick and choose if and when they want to participate, and if so, how much. So we like a hard tech, hard science component, uh, anywhere from two or three months of due diligence to upwards of a year. And uh, we're uh, getting a marriage with the companies, and we're with them from start to finish. Awesome. Now, guys, I just want to say that if you're interested in learning more about V Capital and you want to know, for example, how best to pitch their firm, maybe you have an idea and you want to reach out to Ryan, please check out Minnow Tank's YouTube channel where we did a long form interview with Ryan. So we asked the hard questions like, how do we properly pitch you guys? Tell us more about you. You know, who are you looking for? And that kind of stuff. So we won't get into that too much today, um, but we did get into that on the YouTube channel. So you can always go back and we have a playlist there for you that'll explain all about uh, what it looks like to work with V Capital and how to contact them. So thank you very much, Ryan. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and bring on our first startup. So I'm going to put you away. Um, all right. So before we get started, um, before we bring on our very first pitch, I want to talk a little bit about Sheldon Smickley. Um, so I met Sheldon. He actually contacted us. So he was one of our organic folks that came through our waitlist program, which we're thrilled to have. Uh, and Sheldon has built something truly amazing. As an avid podcast listener myself, after watching the rise of podcasting um, over the past couple of years and seeing that it became, you know, almost an aspect of my own life, um, I'm, I cannot be more excited about hearing more about Potable and the company that's coming on today. Uh, so I am thrilled to bring on a startup that I think can revolutionize the relationship between podcasters and advertisers, Potable. Uh, so Sheldon, I'm turning off your mute and go ahead and introduce yourselves. Awesome. Hi, I'm Sheldon Smickley, and I'm the uh, CEO of Potable. I'm Sam Miller. I'm the chief advisor to Potable. Yeah, Fantastic, guys. Go ahead. Yeah, so we're creating, like you said, thank you for that intro, we're creating the marketplace itself for the podcasting industry, trying to shape and fix the uh, kind of broken ecosystem when it comes to advertising authors and also listeners. So I'm going to throw up our deck really quick. Cool. Can everyone see that? No responses, guys. Yes, we can see it. Great. Uh, make sure you do full screen it for us. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. Cool. So podcasts are growing like crazy right now. In reality, there's about 45 million people that listen to a podcast every single week. That number is growing at about 30 to 40% every single year, and it's starting to exponentially increase. And an average person listens to five podcasts. But what the real problem is, is that there is an issue when it comes to potential ad revenue. So most podcasts actually don't have ads. And what we see here is that only about 95% of the podcasts out there don't have any kind of ad revenue. And this is a real problem. These are the reasons why. So there's actually no UX, uh, they're flying blind, and they don't have any kind of data. Sorry, one sec, I'm having an issue in regards to this. The beauty and the difficulty, guys, this is Ken. So whenever we challenge our startups to be able to pitch live, um, this is half the challenge, uh, is trying to figure out how to do this live. So Sheldon, go ahead and take your time. Thank you. There we go. That's a lot better. Cool. 
So most podcasts don't have ads. Uh, the biggest issues right now are the highest barrier to entry. The advertisers are only going to work with the top 5% of podcasts, the Tim Ferriss, the Joe Rogans, the guys that are out there that don't really need any help in regards to monetizing their content. The second issue is flying blind. Targeting and measurement are the biggest issues. There isn't a way to actually know if a user listened to a podcast, and that causes big issues when it comes to the monetization. And the third is there isn't an issue with programmatic ads. Uh, sometimes authors are a little bit nervous about having content automatically inserted and dynamically inserted because it's unrelated. The other biggest piece that comes to the marketplace is 95% of podcasts actually can't be found. And this comes into the space where the number of authors that are being created every single month is doubling that of the number of listeners. And what we actually found is about a podcast lasts about a year in total. So you have this entire marketplace where a lot of podcasters are going out of business at the same rate of, I'd say, a startup failure rate because they can't monetize and they can't grow. So this is our strategy. We want to connect all the listeners to podcasts by creating an app. We want to empower all the authors to grow their shows through monetization, using analytics and tools. And we want to help all the advertisers be able to reach all those shows by giving personalized advertisements to those listeners. This is an example of the podcast marketplace. Right now you have the hosting companies that are talking to the podcast apps. They're talking to the, the authors as well. And what we're really envisioning is shaking up that marketplace and having us right in the center where we work with the hosting companies in regards to the advertising. We have the relationship with the listeners and give them the best recommendations as possible. And we work with the advertisers through our ad tech network and our experience. So how are we going to do this? Here's our two biggest weapons, technology, and content. So when it comes to content, we think of three big pieces. The first is influ influencers. We noticed that in the Instagram world of influencers, there is an entire opportunity to bring them on into the podcasting space. They want to be able to monetize content. They want to be able to grow their brands. And podcasting is the next big jump. It's really being able to help them get to that, that level without having them do a lot of work. The second is exclusive partnerships. So we focus a lot on building out an, an author community, and of that, we've actually been able to make a lot of relationships with independent podcasters that get millions of downloads that are interested in creating potable-only content, such as audio dramas and one-up episodes, that really seem to draw in the users. The third is the author community. So like I said before, we're looking to unite the 95% of authors together so they can all grow. So they have the tools to be able to monetize and they have the tools to be able to understand their users and grow their shows organically, but also have the right uh, experiences. The second piece is our technology. And this is a really big part. So in our app, we are the only app that provides actual true personalized recommendations. The way that we do that is we take the audio transcribe it into text so that we understand the themes and the relationships of the podcast. And we match it based off of our user history. And that's a big, big draw of what people have been going to our app in the past uh, two or three months. The second piece is author tools. We want to be able to make it so they can easily market. We build out analytics. We build out an embeddable player. We're building out other tools to, to help out our authors. And the third is our ad tech component. We want to be able to connect the advertisers to the podcast and match that with the users to give them the best personalized experiences when it comes to advertising. This is just a quick example of our user acquisition stages. So we started off in stage one where we focused heavily on listeners that want to find new podcasts. They're sort of the podcast core group that are listening to seven to nine podcasts every single week. What we're moving on right now is the author and influencer partnership where we're really starting to start focusing on growth, talking to these independent authors, doing podcast giveaways and contests and exclusive partnerships. The third stage is when we trigger on social and we create an entire community for people to be able to share episodes to each other, comment on it, review, and, and allow podcast authors to grow. And the fourth is a mass, mass appeal. So let's talk about where we've been so far in regards to our beta test. We launched officially in regards to the app on January 1st, but we had our beta start off in, I believe it was November 1st. And of that time period, we've been able to build out to 2,000 users with a 30-minute average user duration and a 10% daily active and a 20% weekly active with no marketing. We've done zero marketing and we've done zero any kind of paid acquisition. 
only focused on word of mouth and also talking to the authors and helping them out with their tools. And the authors send us users, tell them to go listen on Potable to help them grow. This is an example of a platform. I highly recommend everyone check it out. Just go to the App Store, type in P-O-D-I-B-L-E, we're the first one that ranks there. Or you can go to play.potable.com. Regarding the product stages, so this is the first thing we're looking at is focusing on the listener, giving the personalized recommendations, and showing podcasts related based on the, the podcasts that they listen to, finishing up the web and the native platforms, and really improving the app. We're in the middle of stage one and stage two right now. Second stage is focusing completely on the authors, building out their tool sets, allowing them to monetize, giving them high in-depth analytics that uh, Apple and any other provider doesn't give them. And the third stage is really focused on the advertiser side, working with dynamic ad insertion, with, working with our recommendation engine and starting to create a premium content specifically for Potable. To show you what a little bit of our technology, this is what our, our biggest core asset is, which is the, what we call the podcast genome. Essentially, it's, it crawls out the podcast world, it transcribes the audio to text, it executes on machine learning models, and it figures out what the relations of a podcast episode to another episode and an episode to a show and match that to the user based on the interests. And this is how our entire ad engine we really see uh, working along with all the additional targeting, geo, and, and all additional benefits that you get. Regarding our product and revenue timeline, we're having our official launch on March 1st where we're gonna be celebrating with a party in New York City. Um, we've recently, like I said, we put out the app on January 1st and we've seen really great feedback and, and great growth in that range. And once we do the official launch, we're gonna be focusing heavily on growth in regards to exclusive partnerships, building out the technology and start figuring out, you know, continuous growth uh, hacking techniques that we can do. Regarding our revenue model, it's pretty simple. We're looking at premium, which will eventually do $5 a month for premium content for listeners. We look at eventually becoming sort of the Netflix of audio, finding visual content for people and being able to create the best content possible. The second is data, which we have partnerships that we can go and start selling our data. The third is the advertising rev share, which is really what the bulk of it's going to be in the beginning, which is helping advertisers be able to monetize their content easily and dynamically without having to worry about it met, uh, interrupting the uh, quality experience of the user. Regarding competitors, we really don't have a ton. There isn't anyone that's going the player ad tech platform component or trying to reshape the ecosystem. You have players out there that are just other players like Stitcher or Breaker or other individuals that are, uh, you know, they're just interested in the player. You have ad tech companies that are just focusing on trying to help monetize the top one to 5%, but no one's really working on the 95%. And you have platforms like Spotify, which are music platforms in themselves. Sorry. <laughs> Regarding our team, our team has a lot of experience in the ad tech, the analytics, and the consumer tech space. So I'm Sheldon Smickley, I'm the CEO, I have a background in analytics, I worked in the sales engineering world for about three years at TapAd, and that's where I met my CTO, Peter, who has a background in distributed computing and big data. Uh, I'll let Sam obviously introduce himself. Yeah, so I'm Sam, uh, right now sit as the chief advisor at Potable, I was actually a director at Dream Adventures, which is a VC fund here in New York and Philadelphia, focusing primarily on health tech. Um, and had some successful exits myself prior to joining Dreamit. Um, and, you know, we've helped bring on a team of the three players below that have really built a, a strong core of understanding not only technology, uh, podcasting, ad tech, but also understanding the startup landscape. So one of the other advisors and investors is Dougie, who you see on the bottom right, was one of the original founders of Yik Yak and actually exited the business when they were valued at just about half a billion dollars. Um, you know, so we're, we're making sure to surround the company with talent that actually understands not just what it takes to build a platform, but what it takes to build a business. And there's a huge difference in the startup ecosystem of having just something that you can actually use and it functions properly and something that could actually grow into a business that ends up going in a trajectory to make some pretty heavy revenue. Right now, we, uh, we actually are about to close out the 1.5 million convertible note with an 8 million cap we're doing. Uh, we just received a few more investments this week that put a pretty heavy dent in what was left. So if any investors that are, are watching today would actually like an updated cap table or have any interest in jumping in before the round closes, you know, we'd, we'd love to speak to you after this. 
Cool. So we're Potable. Here's all our contact information, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. And, and definitely check out the app. Let us know if you have any feedback. We're always listening. All right, guys. This is Ken again um, with Minnow Tank. Thank you very much, Potable. That was an awesome conversation. Um, love digging in deep into your product. I'm going to bring back on Ryan Cole with V Capital to uh, help our investors kind of have a conversation about what they should look for when they're looking at Potable as an investment opportunity. I'll get out of your way. All right. Sheldon, Sam, great presentation. Great company. I uh, love the way you use machine learning for this growing space uh, for podcasts. A um, few quick questions. I want to jump right to your raise, uh, the 1.5 million ask. Um, when do you plan on raising your next round? So we're probably going to be raising the Series A end of summer, beginning of fall. Um, that will most likely be when that happens. Do you have any idea how much you plan on raising for that round? It's going to be between seven and ten million. Um, the one point five lasts us about a twelve to fourteen month burn. Uh, you know, but coming from the VC world, I know the best time to raise capital is when you don't need to. That way, you don't have to do any desperation raise. So we're going to try and do it in the in the middle of that run. Sure. Do you have a discount on this cap? Eight million cap you have? Is there a discount on that this as well? I believe it's a twenty percent discount. Where I, I would have to check to make one hundred percent sure. Okay, All right, that's about standard. Um, any thoughts on your pre-money valuation for your Series A raise? Um, to be entirely honest, I don't want to put a number on it right now. We know that it's going to be probably around twenty-five to thirty-five million, um, but it honestly depends on where these partnerships fall in line and, and what growth that predicts the business to go in, and, and that will you know dictate the amount that the company's worth. Sure, it's, it's, it's high, but you know, hopefully you could justify. It. I'm sure you guys have a plan to do that. So. This opportunity now, getting it at an eight million cap, is pretty attractive. If you guys can raise money yeah. down the line at twenty five, thirty million dollars, um, um, let's see. What else? So, if you could talk about your competition, please, and, and the barriers to entry. So, what is can prevent someone else from doing what you're doing, and why are you better than the others? Yeah. So it's interesting because a lot of other players are going listener focused. I mean, Apple's had podcasts on their platform for. 10 years, yeah. just about. Yeah. Spotify's had podcasts for seven years. Uh, to be entirely honest with the conversations we've had with the authors that fall in the 95%, a lot of them feel betrayed because Apple didn't give a crap about podcasts for the longest time since Steve Jobs passed away. And Spotify didn't care until they recently realized that you can make money off podcasters. So a lot of them feel as if these platforms didn't care about them for the longest time. And now we're saying, you know what? We're putting our hands out. You guys can make us money. Let's, let's see what we can do here. The other big issue is that the other players are just a pretty UI. There's actually no technology to them. Our recommendation engine is something that we built ourselves. The algorithm has been built by our team, and it's something that no one else has as an asset. They don't have our, our capability in terms of the tech. And they don't have the people in the business that we do. The other thing is the analytics that we've built out that no one else has we can actually show an author the user journey of their listeners, the podcast they listened to before, the podcast they listened to after, where they actually dropped off within the podcast that they're listening to. So there's a lot of tech assets and relationship assets that we have as a business that are pretty defensible for any competitor that tries to replicate it. Okay, interesting. But there's no IP in this space, correct? There's no intellectual so, property? We've been discussing, you know, IP with an IP attorney. I mean, you change one line of code with a, a patent and the patent is no longer, you know, defensible. So the IP is the proprietary algorithm that we do have and the technology that we've built, but there's, there's no patents on it just because it's not. Sure. Understood. It's, you know, we have another comp company, a portfolio similar to you and they, they can't get a patent on it. Um, yeah. So one question we ask these companies such as yours would be, how many years ahead are you of the competition? So if someone wanted to copy you, how many years would they need to, to work to do what you're doing? So I would say that we're a few years ahead of our competition. Um, being that we built it in a system called React, that's pretty much the foundation for the business as it continues going on. There's never gonna be a rebuild. So our MVP was actually the fully functioning business. We didn't go and build something just with you know a few loose lines of code just to see if we can get something to work out and then are going to do version two down the line. Like the, the app itself today is how the app's going to be for years to come. It's just going to have different UI and different functionality. So with that part of it, and that takes a very long time to build itself. You know, it took 
us nearly 12 months behind the scenes to build what we were doing with that. And then another month and a half to actually build out the app. And it's pretty, it translates well. Like if we wanted to build out the Android app, we could do so in just a matter of weeks. So we built something that's pretty scalable pretty quickly. Excellent. Have you raised money prior to this current round? We did a family and friends round of 200,000 uh, in the summer uh, to make sure that everyone could come onto the business full time. And do you have to sign up both the listeners and the authors? So the author just has, yeah, that's a great question. The author just has to put their RSS feed in the platform. It's pretty easy to do. You just copy and paste the link and it automatically adds your podcast to the platform. For the listener, you just have to download the app and sign up through Twitter or Facebook and then you can start using it. I know you guys are early, but do you have any data on the amount? So let's say an author or a how, if you call them a podcast author, um, or speaker, whatever you want to call it, there are numbers of views before you and then after you and what it's done for their viewership? Uh, that's something that we could pull together. We would have to spend some time and actually look at that. We do have a lot of authors that have increasingly had better retention with our app uh, and users that actually continue to keep listening to other podcasts that they never re heard before from the app because of the recommendations that we make. So I think that'd be a huge data point to have, which I think is yeah. somewhat easily obtainable. The other data point I'd love to see was would be uh, the for the listener. So now you have one for the author, then one for the listener. So the average listener listens, you know, I think you mentioned 30 minutes using Potable, right? Per, yeah, on their daily per, session. Well, not just daily session, per session. Well, so they can okay. leave and they can come back. Our, our average number of daily sessions was about three or four. Right, and how that compares to someone not on um, Audible. Like what's the, what's the average overall? Um, so comparing both from the listener side and from the author side, I think those two data points would be great to have um, and help with your, you know, getting advertisers to advertise with you. Um, where do you see the inflection point for this? Where do you see the point where, you know, this is going to be out there and, and you can capture most of the market share? Yeah. So we've been doing this strategically. We wanted to make sure that we were building out the app so that way when it does the public launch, that it launches as best as it's gonna be at that point in time. So because we've strategically taken chunks of beta testing to make sure that our users are as happy as they can be, we're pretty confident with the partnerships we have in the pipeline that once this launches publicly on March 1st, that this thing's gonna pretty much hockey stick and take off. So it, it's in the next coming weeks. Guys, I'm just going to pop in here. We have time for one more question for Potable. I just want to remind the audience, you guys are more than welcome to tune in and actually ask your own questions. There's no questions from the audience yet, so I'll let Ryan ask one more question. Um, and thank you guys. You guys have done awesome. Excellent. Yeah, this is more of a, a you know, fun question. Where do you see uh, your exit? And when do you think you'll be able to be acquired? Or how do you plan on exiting? Is there any comps that you could compare it to that say, okay, we think in four years, you know, we could have a, a 7x times, you know, 7x revenue. You know, what have you seen in your research? Yeah, so, you know, compared to the, well, we, we've had an offer of, of, you know, rumblings for an acquisition already. Um, we said no to it because we wanted to make sure that we were seeing the long-term vision of what the company could be yeah. and actually optimizing what the return on the business will be. So, we see this thing getting acquired for a lot of money and it's primarily because we're tapping into a revenue stream that will one day start looking like the market that radio advertising has. Yeah. Being that we're looking to be the Netflix of audio and we see the trajectory of those businesses, we could see it being a similar um, exit price point. The thing that we have to make sure that we end up doing the best is going to be having that premium content and making sure that our ad platform works the way it, it should. So we're looking at it where if I'm a New York Jets fan and I listen to a lot of Jets podcasts, I should hear ads about Jets season tickets. And that's going to make the conversion rates, which are about 60% right now for ads with an audio, actually increase and go near towards 80 to you know, 85%. And if we can do that, then you know, it's, it's going to be a pretty heavy exit. All right, guys. And with that, we're going to have to cut it off. So Sheldon and Sam, thank you very much. Fantastic pitch. I'm going to go ahead and remove your video. Um, if Sheldon and Sam were your favorite, please don't forget to go to minotank.com slash vote. Uh, Ryan, I'm going to put you away so we can get our next startup up. Uh, 
So don't forget to go to minotank.com slash vote and vote for your favorite pitch now. All right, guys. So um, thanks again, Sheldon, Sam, for such an awesome pitch. Next, I want to invite Phil Canaby. Canaby, I'm sorry. I'm Phil, I always mispronounce your name. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> Phil with Coupon Wallet on the show. Uh, Phil is not only doing something amazing for the environment, which I really appreciate because, you know, as we all know, coupons and coupon printing and this typing is a ridiculous pollutive um, currently. But also, I believe that it's an amazing time right now to be in a space where you could have an omni-channel opportunity to be able to follow basically, you know, and, you know, Phil will talk about it more, but you can click a, you know, you uh, a YouTube ad or click a Facebook ad, it brings you a coupon and you can bring that coupon on your phone to the store. Um, Cause you know, there's so many opportunities that we really miss out on. And Phil will talk more about how many coupons are actually used. Um, but Phil, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Oh, thanks Ken. Uh, yeah, it's uh, great to be here on Minnow Tank. And uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to go over uh, basically the, the coupon market a little bit, uh, but uh, I have my, my uh, slide deck here ready as well. Uh, did you want me to start that right away? Uh, yeah, it's it's preferable so we can kind of walk along with you, please. Okay. All right. So uh, Coupon Wallet. Uh, coupon Wallet is a platform that's game-changing technology for mobile coupons. Um, we're creating the future of mobile couponing. And in doing so, we're going to become the number one platform for mobile coupons. And I really say platform because... I'm not talking about we're just an app for coupons. Uh, we're actually the, basically the platform that allows other companies to distribute mobile coupons through their own apps as well. The coupon life cycle for a consumer is pretty simple. Uh, they find the coupon anywhere in digital media or uh, even print media. They might be able to scan a QR code with their phone. They might click a link online. Um, it doesn't really matter what channel the coupon is distributed in. What matters is that the consumer is easily able to get that coupon onto their mobile phone and take that phone with them to the store to scan the phone at the checkout and get that coupon discount redeemed right there on the spot. Um, but the best part for us is beyond that. It's the, the marketing channel tracking because we know where that coupon actually came from, if it came from Facebook, if it came from a, a Google ad, uh, but we would know that that coupon was actually used in the store uh, through our platform technology. Uh, beyond that, even further, uh, coupons have to be tracked for clearing purposes and reimbursement of face value to retail locations. Um, that's something that uh, is a key differentiator for us. Coupon Wallet's the only mobile coupon platform available right now that offers real-time clearing combined on the point of sale with omni-channel ROI tracking so we can attribute those revenue dollars uh, to the actual campaigns that were run. Um, and, you know, th this is a digital uh, world that we're entering here. And if any of these retailers really want to keep up with Amazon, um, they're going to need to start doing this right away. And if they don't, they're going to get what my co-founder says, uh, blockbustered. They're just going to get wiped away. There's a lot of competitors in this space, but most of them, uh, they're what you would call a pure play, where they have one app of their own and they distribute the mobile coupons to their own audience. Um, they don't do a lot of tracking uh, on the initial front point. They don't attribute which channels people came in from to get that coupon. Um, and a lot of them don't have any capability whatsoever to work with manufacturer coupons like we do. And this is a huge market. I mean, there's a, a half a trillion dollars of coupons being distributed every year. And still 90% of those are all printed coupons. Um, it's incredible. And the digital distribution is tiny in comparison, only like two and a half percent. But those make up over 7% of the coupons used in store already. Uh, this is just incredible. There's a huge discrepancy between the volume of print coupon offers and the number of people that are coming in and using them digitally. Um, but it's still tiny. This is still a, an infant stage market. So our founding team has over 75 years of combined experience. My experience is primarily in the uh, web development space and digital marketing. 
Uh, and my CMO also came from a digital marketing background. Uh, he's also an expert iOS developer. Uh, we also have uh, a great CIO. He's got uh, 27 years or more of network experience and network security. Uh, he's also a serial entrepreneur like myself. And uh, Gerald Zwas, uh, he came on board because he loved our idea so much. And he's got his uh, uh, background in finance and uh, investment banking. Um, he's going to be helping us through this process. We have a three-stage growth strategy that we're using to get through all of the, uh, the smaller stage stuff that we have to. Uh, we already did our proof of concept uh, where we acquired um, about 27,000 or more small business clients across the country. And they've produced over 60,000 uh, mobile coupons and distributed those through their own social media um, and uh, we, we've uh, been able to leverage that to build the platform out, get a big audience growing uh, and uh, our, get us to our next step where we're actually starting to acquire mid-sized retailers. And uh, this is where things get really interesting. And this is where we start building white label apps with their own branding on them. Uh, and these are bigger clients that have a larger base of customers that they can use to get the, these coupons out to their audience. And we're really gonna start to get a lot bigger user base and a lot more coupon data of all these coupons being used in store. As we become uh, an industry leader, uh, we'll be able to leverage that critical customer base uh, to attract manufacturers and their uh, consumer packaged goods coupons. Uh, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, uh, those manufacturers can't even really run uh, nationwide mobile coupon campaigns very easily yet because they don't have the clearing platform and the tracking technology to follow all that financial data about the coupons used in their customers. Right now, we're looking to raise a million dollars for our seed round. Um, we've already had uh, some contributions from our founders. We've put in about $160,000 ourselves. We also got a couple, uh, basically, uh, it's money from the incubator that we were part of. And uh, also we have two investors with convertible notes in so far for this round. Uh, our preferred close is in about three months. And we're gonna raise the first 500,000 as a separate tranche uh, with a, a bit of a discount. Most of the capital requirements gonna to go towards sales and marketing and research and development. This will give us about an 18 month run and that's gonna actually take us into uh, 2019 where we'll do our next round. We are generating revenue already. Uh, we've doubled our revenue in 2017. It's still small, it was about a little over 200,000 for 2017 and we're gonna more than double it in 2018 uh, using some of the money that we raised in this round to really boost things up. Um, and thank you. I, I uh, hope you got a lot of information and you're interested in this opportunity. Thank you, Phil. All right, I'm bringing Ryan on again. Give me just one moment. Ryan, you are unmuted. Okay, guys, I'll get out of your way. Uh, Phil Kanabi, thank you very much. Sorry for mispronouncing your name. Uh, okay. You go ahead, Ryan, ask some questions. All right, Phil, we gotta ask, any story between your firm and uh, your cowboy hats you guys are wearing? <laughs> uh, well, you know, we all wear many hats, uh, so uh, it was actually a running joke. Uh, we, we had just one of us wearing a hat in the photo, and then we all decided, well, we should all be wearing hats. Uh, the, only, the only picture we couldn't find was one for Gerald, and we were joking about drawing a hat on him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's very focused on the finance. He's a CFO, CFO so I guess that's okay, right? Yeah. Um, that's why he's only wearing one hat. Excellent. All right, good presentation. Um, do you mind walking me through it? So let's say I'm a customer. Let's do it from the customer side. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a coupon user. And then I, I also talk to me from a client side. So let's say you want some store, Best Buy, for example, to become a client of yours. Can you walk me through both situations, please? How it works. Absolutely. So if you're a consumer and you happen to find one of the coupons that are already out there, whether it's an ad or a, a printed material coupon that you scan with your phone, um, basically, it's a short link or a QR code that's been generated by our, by our platform, which will track the, the source of that person and also drive them into downloading the app on their phone immediately. 
um, whether it's our app or one of our partner apps that are using our API. Um, so it'll actually let the consumer just get the app right away. It's, the apps are free. Um, you want the consumers to get the free coupon to come into the store and use it. And after they come in and use it, then we track it at the point of sale. So we'll know whether it came from Facebook and we'll actually be able to know which customers came where, which customers use which coupons and be able to push them new coupons based on their purchasing habits. Anything to do with proximity or where I'm at? Let's say I'm walking through a mall and I'm walking by five different stores and you see my purchasing history or you know my likes, dislikes. Would you then send me coupons when I walk by a store that alerts me, okay, this store is having 20% off, whatever it is? Well, you can do that. Uh, iBeacons are, uh, it's not really new technology at all. It's actually just a way to push a, a mobile link over to a device that's nearby and it uses low power Bluetooth to do that. Um, yeah, we definitely work with iBeacons all the time, especially to track people that walk by a store but don't go into the store. Uh, we just we need to know how many consumers are walking by and not even visiting in, in a lot of cases. Okay. Now, how about from the store standpoint, how do they work with you? Yeah, so for the major retailers, uh, we have a, it's a software as a service platform, and we have it uh, billed out as a per location per month flat fee. Uh, so it's not a per coupon rate for, for a small business. It's just one small location, uh, one small fee per month. So it's more like a phone bill. Uh, but uh, as you get to a larger company, somebody like Best Buy, our, our rates are still per location, but we'll give volume discounts for uh, much larger clients. And uh, once they have our technology in place and they can track through the, the point of sale, then they'll just start pushing out their coupons through any of their own marketing channels. Uh, even on their TV radio commercials, you could push a coupon by offer code uh, to be able to just do a, a short URL or type it into a, a, a form really uh, to be able to find out which marketing channel drew, drew in those customers. Phil, I have a question from the crowd. Um, we have a question about geofencing. So can you go a little bit, just, just in one or two sentences, what is geofencing and how would that work with your business? Absolutely. Geofencing is the ability to basically put a, a GPS uh, radius per se, a fence around a certain area. So if you wanted to target customers that are within uh, five miles of your business location, you could geofence a five mile radius around your business and be able to push out to those people in that, in that area. When they enter that radius, they will get a push notification on their phone uh, with that coupon attached. Your, uh, so if I recall correctly from one of your slides, the use of digital coupons is about 7%, is that right? Yeah, it's 6.7 I think is actually what it was last year, uh, but it's probably closer to seven at this point. Do you have stats? Or data on coupon wallets use case? Uh, we do have a lot of information. Um, I do know from what we've done so far, the people that actually put the coupon on their phone, there's usually a 10 to 20% redemption rate depending on how good the offer is and how close they are to that business. The closer they are, uh, the more often they'll actually go to that business location and use the coupon. Okay. On your next raise, you want to raise 10 million on a 30 million pre-money valuation. Um, well, that would be hopeful. Uh, we'll have to get there, but uh, I think uh, if we can prove the growth and keep our revenue increasing, we might be able to justify that valuation. Right. When you plan to raise that round, where do you anticipate your revenue being? Was it 2019 is when you plan on raising that money? That round? Uh, hang on one second. Okay. So 2019, uh, we're predicting about 2.3 million in revenue for that year. Is that when you plan on raising that big $10 million round? Uh, well, <laughs> we would be starting, that's for sure. Okay. Hey guys, just a one minute warning, one minute left, okay? Sure. All right, thanks, Ed. Um Yeah, I'd recommend, you know, obviously you can't tell the future and forecast or just forecast. Um, it's a pretty lofty uh, pre money valuation if it's based on even $3 million in revenue. Um, 10x times the revenue. Uh, that's a lot to ask, um, such an early stage. And I'd recommend, you know, see what happens. Hopefully you get 
three million, five million, ten million in revenue, and you grow quickly. Um, but perhaps you consider maybe breaking that round down to um, five million dollar raise at a smaller premium valuation, assuming you hit certain milestones. Then you raise the second half of that ten million raise at a higher valuation. So maybe average it out thirty. Maybe you raise the first round at fifteen million, the next round at forty five, if you could justify it. Um, just yeah, that's that's um, entirely possible. And uh, uh, one of the things that I don't really have on our slide decks are some of the clients that we're working with currently. And we have broken into some of the larger retailers. Uh, so we have uh, actually the second largest uh, sporting goods retailer on board, and uh, they'll be having their custom white label app out here this next month. So uh, the revenue is actually going to go spiking up quite a bit, uh, even in this first quarter. All right, we've got 30 seconds probably left. So real quick, we like to pick the jockey more so than the horse. Why would someone want to bet on you? What, what do you have? Why coupon wallet? Why you? Why the team? 30 seconds if you can. Okay, so uh, I have quite a bit of experience in startups. Uh, as a developer, I actually started working with uh, startup companies throughout the area, developing websites and uh, technology that drives big platforms. Uh, I've, I've had a lot of experience in big data. And uh, basically, some of the startups I've worked with have already exited. Uh, one in particular uh, was sold to Salesforce uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, I've been through the process from start to finish many times. Uh, I've also had some experience doing my own, and I think uh, we have something here that's really going to take off, and I'm just going to take this all the way to the finish line. All right, great. Okay, guys, all right, thank you very much. Uh, Phil, that was an awesome pitch. I'm gonna go ahead and mute you both and turn off your videos. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, if you guys think that Phil had the best pitch for today, please do us a favor and uh, go over to minotank.com slash vote and you'll be able to vote for him being our best pitch for the day. Um, so the next company we are bringing up, we have Chris and Andrew from Marketplace.City. And not only is Marketplace.City paving the way for smart cities to make better decisions faster, but also out of three out of more than 300 entries from 58 countries, Marketplace.City was awarded the Innovation Idea Award at the 2017 Smart City Awards in Barcelona last year. Welcome, Chris and Andrew from Marketplace.City. Thanks, Ken. I'm, Thanks. Andrew, I'm Andrew Watkins, the president and CEO of Marketplace.City. And Chris Foreman, CEO of Marketplace.City. Can you see us okay, Ken? You guys are coming in clear. You're dark, but that's, that's can't, can't change the darkness. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as Chris pulls up the uh, slides, um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. So Marketplace.City, we are a platform to connect cities to the ever expanding technology universe to make it easier for cities to find, validate, and implement new technology solutions. You can think of us as an Angie's list for government. So what is a smart city? You've probably heard the term, but really it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's using the technology that we're seeing in the consumer and business to business world and applying it to the government space and the public sector. So things like mobility, sensing and big data, machine learning, all those technologies are now starting to impact our transportation systems, our water, electric, uh, social services, really anything that touches the, that the government is delivering is now starting to be affected by this technology. Why is that happening? The biggest one is the technology is ready. The cost is down. Is there demand by citizens who are comfortable using it in the rest of their life and want to see it in all aspects of their life? And governments need to become more efficient, both from a cost point of view and trying to deliver better city services. Um, and this doesn't apply just to the mega cities. So New York, Chicago, and LA are doing it, but also any city at any level is really becoming a smart city. So Cary, North Carolina, or Herndon, Virginia. So the market's pretty good sized. Uh, it's uh, going to be an over trillion dollar market uh, in the next five years. Um, it's, and right now there's over a hundred billion dollars in spend um, at the US state and local level. So it's US alone at over a hundred billion dollars in 2017. The government wants to lead and has an appetite to lead because they need to, as I mentioned, with some of the budget pressing issues, uh, make changes to their structure, but it's a crowded and confusing space. There's over 100,000 different buying entities, government buying entities in North America, and the players change every day and the products change every day. It's not uh, like the things that we're buying before, like a concrete or a light bulb. Um, it might not change as rapidly. Uh, some of these sensing tools and um, data analytics tools are changing um, every month, every year, those types of things. 
Yeah, so we built the, the platform for these two groups to meet and to interact. So we have a city user who is looking for a new technology. They're trying to solve a problem within their city. They come to marketplace.city. It's completely free for them to access the marketplace. And they see our roster of vendors that have products that are tailored for uh, city adoption. Those vendors publish the products um, that they've used and through their own product profiles as rich media around what the products do um, and also maybe some solutions where they've deployed along with some professional services or partnered with other technology companies as well. When they've actually deployed within the city, they publish a validation that goes on the site as well. And then we can verify that validation through the content that they provide us, either through case studies, press releases, government contracts, what have you. And then we also get verifications from existing city users as well. So if you publish a validation with a government and then we have a city user on our platform that can verify that validation, they can go and identify themselves as being involved with that deployment. And then they can network with other city users. So some people can find them and say, okay, you've done work with this vendor. What do you think of it? What was your experience, best practices, what have you? And then they can also see the data that's associated with the vendor and with the case study that was, that was published and then also the, the products that are involved as well. So what we're doing is tapping into a, a very large market, bringing functionality of ratings, reviews, recommendations that we use in our daily lives to say, decide what doctors that see us, what restaurants we eat at, what hotels that we stay in, and we're bringing that into the public sector. We have a lot of existing, you know, some precedents of companies that have built ratings and review sites and have created a platform and then built enormous revenue models off of that and have been very successful companies. However, this hasn't really been done within the public sector yet. Public sector typically lags, but in this case, the you know, cities are innovating with the adoption of all this new technology, and this area is ripe uh, for a platform like ours. So where have we been thus far? So we launched a beta with New York City at the end of 2016, and I think it's really uh, important and critical to you know, sort of our success. This idea originated within city government, within uh, the department, uh, the Mayor's Office of Innovation Technology in New York. Uh, so after that beta, New York helped drive this forward, and we launched in November of last year with four cities on board, New York, Atlanta, uh, Barcelona, and Dublin, real leaders in the smart city space. Uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, it, in that same month at the Barcelona Smart City Expo, which is the largest uh, in the world, out of over 300 applicants, we won the Innovative Idea Award on the basis of the fact that we were working with cities and we were creating the partnerships and collaboration with what, which all the outside groups think is key. So entering 2018, uh, we have the momentum with uh, 30 cities actually already on board and over 350 companies, which allows us to position to capture a big chunk of this global market. So as I mentioned that, scale is key. Scale is key in sort of any marketplace situation. So we've tried to keep the barriers of entry low. Um, it's free for cities to use uh, for us in really lowering that bar for a group that is sometimes harder to get to move uh, or to move quickly. Um, and then vendors can create profiles for free, but then pay a monthly prescription fee, fee to uh, get the validations and have the two-way interaction with cities, which is what they, they really crave. This is a foothold into the larger market, whereas these hardware and software has become more standard uh, to be able to transact on the platform, taking forces of that and enter into the end-to-end -end procurement market uh, within the public sector. Okay, so a little bit about us. So Andrew here is uh, president and CEO of the company. Andrew spent the uh, majority of his career either consulting large organizations on the growth and expansion or uh, launching uh, startups and launching a, uh, an incubator here in the city of Chicago to help the, the city sort of find, evaluate new technologies. Um, so he's seen this problem from, the, from that city side and also working with technology companies trying to work uh, with government. Um, my name is Chris Foreman, so I'm CEO of the company. I've spent 15 years in the technology sector, 10 of which with a software company, joining it when it was in single digit millions, leaving it when, when it was in the triple digit millions as the CEO. Uh, for the America's business. And so I've seen um, all the, you know, the trials and tribulations of growing sales organizations and reaching new markets uh, and growing companies. And then Cameron Kozan, who is our CTO and head of product. So he's built the beautiful product that we have today, uh, which we're very fortunate that on, you know, the first you know, day of release on November 14th, we had the product that was there, we're able to accept people. And then we're in our first month of actually uh, receiving revenue as well. So that takes us into the next step. So in this funding round, we're asking for a million dollars uh, to focus on three main areas. Uh, the first being sales and marketing. So obviously we have on one side of the platform, we have our 
product users are, are vendors uh, that are putting profiles into this into the platform. So we're reaching out to them, telling them the value that we have, and then bringing them into the platform. Our community de development, which is working with our cities. So we have a, a great group of cities that are on board now, about three dozen cities that are with us today. Um, big cities, um, all the way down to really small, uh, you know, small local municipalities as well. So we wanna go deeper within those cities, learn what they're um, evaluating and looking to purchase in the next year, two, three years, um, so we can find the right vendors in order to fit the marketplace. And then lastly, to continue our product development. So we've invested a lot in product development up to here to have a, a production product uh, release. But obviously, there's always things we'd like to add uh, and modify within the product in order to create a great experience uh, for our city users and for the, the product companies that are on as well. So we'll wrap up there. We hope you join us in uh, really connecting the government users with technology companies that are out there, lowering the transaction costs of adopting new technology in government, and then really improving the quality of life for citizens of cities all around the world. All right, guys, that was a fantastic pitch. Thank you very much, Chris and Andrew. I'm going to get out of your way. I'm going to let uh, Ryan go ahead and ask you some questions. All right, Chris, Andrew, nice presentation. I'm going to start with your million-dollar raise. What do you get for that? Yeah, so we're uh, focused at, uh, in terms of on uh, the, the valuation we're thinking is a $6 million, uh, sort of free money. Um, and then, as Chris said, you know, we're using that to hit sort of the critical masters right now um, with our, we have a good base of cities and uh, companies, um, really using that to get out and make it sort of a contact sport to, to bring on a lot more people. All right, excellent. Have you raised capital yet for this company prior to this round? Yeah, we did a friends and family round of 300,000, uh, which Andrew and I also put in on that. Um, so we're already invested in the company, both at sweat equity and financially. Uh, and a lot of that went to building the product that is today. All right, excellent. Um, are all three of you full-time on Marketplace City? Yeah, the two of us are full-time right now, and Cameron is, uh, is part-time on it. Um, and he runs an innovation and uh, design studio uh, in Brooklyn where we are able to use their resources um, sort of as we need it. So it was a really good situation in the fall where we had about eight people working on it um, and on November and October, October, November to get it out the door. But right now is we're a lot more in maintain and uh, adding content. We're not sort of paying for uh, development resources we don't need. Sure. Chris, how about being CEO at Glasswater, what, what happened there? What did you leave? What, what's going on with the company? Yeah, so when I, when I left my uh, software company at Point, I wanted to start a new software company because uh, I've uh, attended more on the product side. But I didn't have the funding. I didn't have a great idea. So I started a consulting company. That's what Glasswater is. Um, and my first client was actually UI Labs. And that's where Andrew helped to start up UI Labs and uh, was working on a, a, a smart city project there, actually running it on the ground level. Um, and so I you know, worked with them and we sort of identified this problem, decided that this would be the product that I'm going to dedicate my time to. So while uh, Glasswater still exists, that's uh, being you know, basically put to the side. I'm dedicating 100 percent of my time towards Marketplace.City. All right. Excellent. Um, could touch on the comp I want to touch on competition. I want to talk, uh, touch on your revenue model, um, financial forecasts. And uh, where do you want to start with those three? We start with the competition. Uh, so I'll just to, to answer the question, I mean, the biggest real competition right now is uh, Google. I mean, that's how people are searching for these projects, either that or going to a smart city event for two days. There are a couple of other startups um, in the space who are generally tackling it from one area. So they're focused on the, you know, new technology for water market or for resilient infrastructure. Um, the key differentiators that we have is we are working with cities to help build this and have, have that model. There's another one out there um, that is focused on they sell to cities to sort of be their um, innovation guides through the smart city reality, but they're send, their revenue cycle is then based on the city sales cycle and not from you know, vendor sales and marketing. Yeah, I think side. one thing that's important is that we're looking to go product first. So develop this engine that has the content, uh, originally provided and make recommendations to the, uh, our city users somewhat manually, but to build additional machine learning into the platform so that the platform itself will, will make recommendations to the cities based on their demographics. So where they're located in the world, uh, how much budget that they have, how they rank their priorities, and then what other cities have used that fit similar profiles. Okay, excellent. Uh, how about your revenue model? How do you, I know you're charging the provider. Yep. They pay a set fee per month, is that right? Yeah, per product per month. So if you're a startup with one product, it, the, the pricing right now is $12 a month per product. Um, and so if you're a startup and you're brand new and you have one product, that's what you pay. But if you're Cisco and you have 
you know, 30 different things you want to sell into cities, you pay, you know, for 30, 30 different products at the, at the same, at the same rate. Is it, is it New York your main city right now? Uh, we have, so New York, uh, has, yes, the most active users, which is probably not surprising since the given their size, but we have a lot of active users in, uh, Vancouver, uh, Dublin, uh, Amsterdam. I, we have cities all over that are using it for various things. We're about to launch something with uh, the city of Vancouver. Um, so it, all, all over the board. Yeah. I'd say part of the reason that we did this is because of the overwhelming commitment from cities like New York, yeah. you know, like companies in our state. Um, don't always have the, the you know, luxury of having a city like New York um, supporting them. And then even prior to us really getting involved, when Cameron was still working with New York City, um, you know, New York had done the work of talking to other leaders in cities and saying, hey, if we do this, are you on board? And so they already had a lot of the buy-in from some of these other major cities um, to, to join the platform. And so we benefited from that a lot um, starting out. So if you go to our site, you can see we publish uh, the cities that are on board. And it's, it's you know, from – Large, you know, cities around the world, uh, all the way down to, you know, um, you know, small towns. Forest, Illinois. Yeah. Right. Have you been able to dominate? I'd like to see, you know, can you dominate New York City to the point where you can say, hey, this works. We make it a lot easier to raise capital and then uh, easier also to deploy in other cities as well. Because it's got to be costly to go to, from city to city to city. So if you could prove one, show it works. It's a great idea. It's needed. It's the future. I 100% get it. Um, I, my only concern is execution. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what we're looking to do in this round is to invest in going deeper within these cities, developing direct relationships, getting to the procurement officers who are running the processes and then you know showing the value to them. So they're using in addition to the people who are the various business units and departments who are doing evaluation as well. So that's what we're trying to invest in this next round. OK, do you mind talking about revenues, uh, what you did in 17, what you forecast for this year? 19, 20, et cetera. Yeah, so it's um, so we did no revenue in 17. If we launched the product in November and it was you know free, sort of the consumer model to start out. Our first revenue is this month, so it's pretty small right now. Forecasted to be about 250,000 um, in um, 2018, um, and then you know growing over the course of the three years using just this model um, can grows it to uh, between seven and eight million. I can't remember the exact amount. Obviously, it's a forecast, so that that amount will change. Uh, but you know you can create a pretty healthy revenue model on just the subscription, but the key piece sort of, as we mentioned, is we already have um, companies coming to us and saying, can we publish our pricing? You know, we sell directly to cities. We want to lower the transaction costs. If they know the price that Atlanta paid and they want the exact same thing, especially for some of the hardware components, we want them just to be able to buy it. So this is sort of the foothold into the ability for these cities um, to transact directly on it um, on standard state level contracts or other types of things. But you know, can grow it into 10 plus million revenue on just the directory model alone and the data and the sort of buyer intent that you get from the network allows us to have sort of other revenue models and other services. Yeah, I have a lot of experience working with government contracting. So there are a lot of sort of government wide contracts that will publish prices or vendors will uh, pre-negotiate discounts for their products uh, for the government. And that's done the federal level and also uh, quite widely in the state and local. The problem is these, these systems that exist today are extremely analog. They're not digital. It's very difficult to sort of go in and just, you know, click and purchase a product the same way you would on Amazon. So we're sort of leading on this digital front um, that a lot of people are, are not already addressing. I love how you guys are moving, you know, now. This is the time to do it. I, I agree. Um, when, what year do you think will be when this becomes commonplace, um, where all this takes off? Yeah, I mean, I think the, um, you know, I think that with clearly within the three to five year window, I mean, the key piece that we've seen from cities is there is um, there when New York and other big cities, they're the ones with the budgets to try out new processes, new things, new types of that. When, uh, you know, IoT was coming up, New York took the lead on releasing IoT guidelines and right away, 40 major cities around the world adopted them. And now more or less all the city organizations and the, you know, organizing groups reference their guidelines as if you're going to put a sensor in the public space, this is what you should do. So we don't see it as sort of as that different than with our process. As the big cities take the lead, the smaller cities don't have time to do process innovation. They're just trying to run their city and they're looking to sort of step into this. And I think, uh, you know, all these tech, not from a technology point of view, these technologies they're buying are here. I mean, there's uh, technology components of basically every major lighting, water, electricity, transportation project that's going on now. And so these CIOs and CTOs who don't necessarily have 
experience in all of these or city managers in all of these um, ver technology verticals need some place and need some resource because they're getting asked one day to do core IT systems, the next day to do a traffic management system, the next day to do um, something with pedestrian counts. Sure. Who do you imagine would be a potential acquirer of your company in the future? I mean, it's interesting you say that. Uh, to give you maybe a comp, there's another company that's actually based here in Chicago that does software reviews. Um, they've, you know, probably five-year-old company. They've grown up uh, quite a bit. Um, where just on barely $10 million in revenue, they were able to get a $100 million valuation. And they took investment from one of the biggest venture capital firms in Silicon Valley and LinkedIn. Uh, so it was surprising to see LinkedIn sort of get into like a software review space. Um, Gartner has also been doing, having a lot of activity in the space. So a very you know, large public company that's focused on uh, generating content around um, you know, analysts and, and, you know, best practices and, you know, best, you know, technology companies to be investing in the market trusts a lot. They do a lot of um, uh, acquisitions in this space. Uh, but also, you know, as we all know, LinkedIn is also owned by, you know, Microsoft. So there are a lot of, you know, big technology companies uh, that are looking to move into this space as well. One of the challenges that the government market um, is very nuanced. So you have to understand how it works. You have to understand the rules of engagement. Um, I think that's an advantage that we have over people who don't typically do business um, with in the government space. Yeah, because other the other companies don't have their B two B focus and don't have the sort of B two G sector, which is really similar um, on their roadmap because they know it's not an area of expertise. And so our ability to build that market and capture that market creates sort of a great adjacency for any of them. All right, guys, we have time for one more question. I just want to remind the crowd, if you guys have any questions for Marketplace.City, you can send them in on the live YouTube chat. But otherwise, uh, we have time for one more question, guys. All right, guys, uh, why you? Why should uh, I or someone listening to this invest in you guys? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the piece, um, you know, we, we have sort of all of the areas of, the, of uh, the experience sort of surrounded. So I have spent a lot of time you know, problem solving, working with cities, standing up these projects, understanding these things, sort of the operational expertise. Chris has the sales background, selling into the public sector, knows very much what, you know, our target customers look like. Um, and Cameron has spent his entire career uh, creating, um, you know, great web products and web experiences uh, that keep people in. And we know, you know, with that, uh, user experience is key to have people come back, right? I mean, if we have all the contracts and all the information they want up there, but it's hard to find, no one's going to use it. But if we make a sort of easy process for people to go through, um, you know, we have those pieces around it. And then we have the city participation. I mean, we have active involvement, not only at a user level, but also on a feedback loop level from um, CIO, CTOs, innovation leads in these big cities. And that's, you know, we plan to continue that and start to formalize it this year with a sort of board of them. Yeah. And anecdotally, if I could say, I mean, Andrew, is you know a, a genius when it comes to you know operations and modeling. I, he's got a model built before I you know finish a sentence. Um, I've spent I say you know 10 years working for a software company, growing a software company. I say it's more like I work 40 quarters there because every single quarter we're talking about you know building revenue, growing a company, hitting you know closing and hitting sales targets and continuing to grow. Um, and then Cameron is you know he's a genius when it comes to product. I was amazed. We made the decision to open up our product profiles to the general public um, right at our at our launch. So we went from what was going to be sort of a closed network. You had to be logged in to see products uh, to something where people could take their links to their products and share them with the world and get a lot more access. In one day, we had the product pages showing up on the first page of Google for our product vendors. And I think that's a lot of value to show back to these vendors and say, hey, you build a profile on our site. And within 24 hours, people are seeing it in their Google search results, and it's drawing them to the site, seeing your validations. Excellent. Nice Thank work, you. guys. Thanks, Ryan. All right, guys. Thank you very much, Chris and Andrew, for your pitch. That was Marketplace.City. All right, guys, I'm going to let you go. Um, thank you very much. Ryan, uh, last few words from you before we get into our finishing comments. I just wanted to hear what did you think of today, and how was it? What was your favorite startup? Oof, that's a lot of pressure. I, you know, they're all great. They're all unique. Um, I see, you know, they're solving problems. They, um, that's a tough one. Um, if you had a gun to my head, which you don't thankfully have right now, um, <laughs> I would, it's a close one. They're all very good. Um, I see potential in all of them. If I had to pick one, God, it might just be Marketplace City because I'm more familiar with the market. 
the IoT market. Um, the podcast thing we're just learning about, you know, um, I'm getting more involved, so I, I, I see a use case for that one. Uh, I love coupons, so I love Coupon Wallet. So I like them all. I like them all. They're all, they're all good companies. Good job screening them. They're well prepared. They nice presentation. Um, and I hope they all succeed. Yeah, a nice big fat tail on each one of these companies. That's wonderful. And, and by the way, for the audience who's, who's learning about what this means in the investment space, TAM is a total addressable market. So one of the biggest parts when you're looking in as an angel investor or you're an early stage investor, you want to see a very large market potential. Maybe the company that you invest in only captures 3 or 4% of a market. But if that market is $10 billion, that's a substantial amount of money. Um, so thank you very much, Ryan. We appreciate it. Thank you for coming on two episodes with us. And that was Ryan Cole from V Capital. My pleasure. Thank you, Ken. All right. See you later. All right, guys. So thank you very much, audience, for tuning in. Now, live audience, is your chance to head over to minotank.com slash vote and cast your vote to decide who wins today's Minotank top pitch crowd choice for January 31st. And for your opportunity as well to win a bottle of Koval whiskey, and a snack pack from T-Squares, which we have a couple flavors right here. I'm not going to eat them now because they're full of caffeine. If you guys didn't know, T-Squares is actually uh, each package uh, or each portion, each serving has half a cup of tea in it. So it will light you up. Um, now, to give the live audience a few minutes to decide who our top pitch was, um, I have a question to ask you. Are you an early stage tech startup founder that would like to pitch live to an audience of over of hundreds of investors on Minotank? Our next episode is early February, and we are very excited to be testing some brand new technology to increase the quality of our show, as well as the user interface. So we'll no longer be using Zoom. It's a little bit clunky, and we're kind of hacking it. We've kind of figured it out. We're going to be upgrading to a much better software, so we're so excited to deploy that. Please subscribe on YouTube so you don't miss our next show. And if you're interested in pitching on, on Minotank, please go to minotank.com and join our wait list. After today's show, I'm going to stick around for just a few minutes. Um, if you guys happen to have any questions, you can go over to our YouTube channel and type those questions in straight to me. If we don't have any questions, we'll just hop out. Um, so if you have any questions, please shop over to YouTube now. So uh, before I bring up Minotank's top pitch crowd choice of 2018, let me go check the numbers real quick. So I'll go back and check out. If you go to minotank.com slash vote, I'll give you one more minute to decide. We have a few last voices coming through. Still checking it out. All right, guys, I'll give you 60 more seconds. Um, if you have some time, please, number one, obviously do subscribe to Minotank. But number two, we did build out our Minotank slash learn. So if you have any questions about, is my startup right? I met a startup or I know some startup founders. I think I'd like to introduce them to Minotank. Fabulous. We love email introductions, but we actually prefer people to come through our um, our wait list because that really helps us in building our show and as well as you know planning out who we'll be pitching next. Um, but more importantly, if you go to minotank.com slash learn, you can see the qualifications. So Minotank obviously can't accept every startup. We, since the new year, have had at least two to three startups apply to pitch every single day. And right now, we're only two shows per month. So as awesome as that is, we love the action. We love the crowd. The fact is, we can just only uh, fit so many folks in the show. Um, so without any further ado, I think we're ready to look at our top pitch. A few more votes coming in. All right. Okay. So... Um, I'm going to do an e-drum roll. The weird thing about live is you can't really do a drum roll. So I hope you guys can hear that. I'm trying to knock on my desk. Okay. And Minotank's top pitch crowd choice for January 31st is a overwhelming majority of Marketplace.City. Uh, thank you very much, guys. So we'll be sending Marketplace.City a bottle of Koval for winning our crowd choice, as well as a, uh, a pack of T-squares. Now, let's see who our audience member was who is going to be selected to win this, um, this prize pack. Let me see. And it looks like we have Max is our winner. So maxkidkapow.com. Uh, we'll be reaching out to you via email. What we'll do is we'll ask you a few questions. So thank you very much, Max. You'll also, thank you for voting and watching. You'll also be winning a bottle of Koval that we'll mail to you, as well as a pack of T-squares. Um, each time you come on the show, there's opportunities to win prizes from our snack sponsors and our vendors. As well, do make sure you contact our sponsors. We have a 
Bradford Allen, Double Take, and Caxi. If you have any questions about that, please feel free to email me. Um, they're always looking to help young entrepreneurs and startups, as well if you're an investor and you're looking at your portfolio and you think they could use some connections to those, we're more than happy to connect them. So thank you guys very much. Thank you, Potable and Coupon Wallet and Marketplace.City and all the teams. And especially thank you to our guest investor, Ryan Cole from V Capital. Now, I'm going to check over on the YouTube channel. If there's any questions, guys, uh, we're more than happy to answer them now. But if not, we'll head out. So I'm checking now. We have a few more folks still on the call, um, but I'm not seeing any questions. There's about a 15 to 30 second delay, just so you know, whenever you do a live stream video. Um, so if any questions you have for me about how to get onto Minotank, what Minotank looks like, um, any of the companies that came on, any of those questions? I'll stick around for one more minute. As I spill my water in my studio. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you very much for tuning in. It seems like we're at the end of the show. Um, look for us. We'll be shooting everybody an email as well as on our social channels. So you can check out our Facebook, Twitter. Uh, we don't have Instagram yet, but we have LinkedIn. So you can follow us there. Um, tune in there so you can check out when our next show is. We usually do our show every other Monday, every other Wednesday. But the fact is, we don't want to do it on Valentine's Day because I'm sure you'd rather be with your partner out there. So we're going to probably do it the day before. We haven't solidified that yet, but you'll hear from us in early February. So thank you very much for tuning into Minotank. Uh, thank you for sending in your questions and your participation, and we'll see you later. Bye, guys.